the lady boss retreat. So if you have a, a lady EP leadership anywhere in, in your realm, a business partner, what have you, uh, there is a leadership retreat happening um, that at the end of April, April 26th. And really exciting. We actually locked in our speakers. Joanne Chan Ooh. is the global CEO of Turner Duckworth. She's been the CEO for since 2014, so almost 10 years. After the company transitioned into the publicist um, group, she took over the CEO and she does an amazing job leading the, the team there globally. It's really great. And Rita Duck Drucker, old friend of mine, former Snapchat, Yahoo, um, understands the marketplace, what clients are looking for. So just open conversation, what's happening. So this lady boss moment is something we want everyone to be part of. And it really is just a day of meeting people, talking, greeting. We have these two ladies talk. And then there's this great thing that um, we've talked about called a nook, which is just really breakout you know, not nothing formal, but just the space allows for different conversations to take place around the center, the, the area. And there's a few mentors that are going to be part of the conversation as well. So um, just want to put that out there. Um, also, if you're uh, part of a Rev community, you might this conversation is coming out of or is now currently inspired by this ongoing uh, conversation right here that Seth started about five hours ago. Um, it's pretty interesting just talking about, I'm, I'm trying to, to get it to a point of like, it becomes a constructive conversation, not just comments like, you know, um, it's the future, it's coming, don't be afraid and so on. But we have to address what the re real issue is around AI so we can know how to critically think our way through it and position ourselves in the right place. So as we have this conversation live here, there's more happening in, on the platform. Just want everyone to know that there's some there's some great stuff popping up, up and down and all around, isn't there? Definitely. And you know, new fresh wave of people freaking out about Sora on LinkedIn, I've seen, you know? Oh, yeah. Did you see that latest video that they put out there? The balloon head. Yeah, the balloon head one. Um, here, um, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's interesting. Um, I had someone break it down for me today and said, had some really smart comments about um, how it looks rotoed. And if it's generative, it should not look like a roto job. Uh, that's a pretty long URL, but I just put it in chat there. If anyone hasn't seen it yet, you would be interested in, supposedly it's the first short story created with Sora. So um, would kind of look at that yeah. as, a, as a tipping well, point. Well, they, they paid a bunch of really talented people to make six of them. And it's the only one that's watchable. <laughs> The yeah, what it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the others are pretty random. Yeah, yeah. And it's, the editing is the best thing about it. Like it's really well edited. Like the the continuity is off. There are different balloons on different heads. It's not a short film in a can, but it is really well edited, and it's got a good idea. But um, it would be better if somebody made it for real. You know, oh, totally. Like, yeah, it's an animatic essentially. It's like yeah. Yeah. yeah, somebody compared it to stock footage. Like that was the, the like, oh, okay, well, this looks like you basically filled in stock footage with, with this, um, you know, now AI generated content. Um, but there is something to, to the conversation of saying like, well, that does sound hel helpful. Instead of doing a stock footage search and clearance rights and whatever, be able to type in some commands and get something as a placeholder or a prep place or whatever, just the amount of person hours used to take to do that. Um, I think that's what we're asking the question about, about when it comes to this AI world that we're living and the platforms that we're building is what's this efficiency thing going to do to us, the benefits of that. Mm. I think when, when you, when you started this topic, Tim, you talked about, you know, navigating new normals, whatever normal is, but we've got like economy and technology. What do you, what's the new normal in the economy? Do you think? So the economy is like an obvious one. Colin, I have you spotlight, but I'm just going to drop, drop you off if you want to. Hey, I actually think that I'm going to turn this over to a gallery mode on my computer here. Anybody just turn on your camera, I'd be happy to have you chime in and be part of the open conversation. It'd be great to to be very open about what's happening and uh, and and have other voices in this conversation. Um, so the economy is crushing us, right? There's uh, definitely the the people are panicking, there are layoffs happening. It's uh, all this, I say this often, but like the economy is doing what it's supposed to do. When you raise interest rates, you make money more expensive. 
when you make money more expensive, you contract it. There's less money to, to do things with. And it, therefore, the pressure's on. Things cost more. Um, the, the availability of cash to invest, to move forward, to grow things, it's all shrinking. Um, many of you might be looking at your savings account and saying, literally, it's shrinking. Like, I have to spend my savings in order to keep things going. And that's what the government does when they raise interest rates. They're trying to get savings out of your pocket because they want money to be worth more in the future. And they're stopping the, the um, inflationary rates and, and that devalues money. So it's doing what it's supposed to do. We shouldn't be surprised. That's what the interest rate conversation is about. What that means for us is that people are making different decisions about what they're going to do and how soon they can do it. One of the things I, I'm seeing is just, for example, how often people are out there pitching on projects and then how often they win. So there's either, I would say traditionally, companies get about 50% win rate on their pitches as a standard. Not everyone has the same number, but something like that. Today, if I were to adjust for what's happening, it feels like 25 to 30%. So you're doing four pitches to win one project instead of two pitches to one win project. So what's happening that you're showing up for four pitches? What's happening to the projects that there is what feels like the opportunity to work because you're doing four pitches, but the reality is there's, there's only one pitch. The agencies or studios or uh, brands that are, that are asking you to pitch, they're doing something in, in the, on their side. They're behaving differently, and that has a feedback loop for us. And if they have less money, they're experimenting more. They're, they're not going to make off-the-cuff decisions because they can't make as great a, a mistakes. So that's one of the things I think is happening is that when you tighten the, the, the money clip, you have people taking less risk and therefore not choosing somebody so as quickly, um, more hesitant, maybe more protocol in-house in before the money can be spent. And therefore, our opportunities are changing. Um, that's the economic side for me. I don't, I don't know if anyone else has any kind of feedback or confirmation that that's what it feels like. Are you, do you guys feel like the win rate has changed from a usually 50% win rate to a 25% win rate or something like that? Go ahead, Lou. Oh. I feel like some of the opportunities, have, like we have fewer pitches and more direct award. I just feel like there's the cadence is lower. So it's the same thing, but a little different. Yeah, the direct award is the other thing I've talked about over the last couple of weeks. It's that the, if the layoffs are happening inside of an agency, a production company, um, uh, a large studio, whatever, a brand, there are fewer people that are making decisions or can handle the workload. So I feel like some of the protocol of procurement is being dropped for efficiency. So it's like Lewis. I'm just going to give you this project instead of go through a pitch process. Um, but because yeah, the decision time. being made, they're not, they're not, you know, not giving you as many chances. They're just giving it to you when the time comes. Yeah. We, we had, we had somebody give us three and ask for a discount, like give us three at once and ask for a discount, which we tried to do correctly as Blair Ann says. Um, <laughs> there's, there's also, people saying things like our marketing people are reevaluating all our all our outgoing opportunities right now like and i don't think they're bsing me you know i think they they're they're actually thinking rethinking things so yeah you know so on, i i just i think the, the cadence is different yeah on a micro scale if you have a production company you might be doing this too where you realize i need a relief relieve myself of some regular cash burn. And so I'm going to reduce my staff and lay off a, a percentage of your staff and converting people to freelance. So on a micro scale, that's happening all over the place. I can see it. Large agencies are closing. Um, what's the one out of Amsterdam that just was announced today? Panic or um, something. There was a larger one that came out today. So the the economy is crushing crushing us and making us make those decisions. The same kind of decision making happens in house with clients as well. Their team is is changing. They need to reduce costs. They're going to convert things to freelance, or in our case, you'd say if they're a brand, they're going to outsource it to us. So there might be work they're outsourcing. 
other people, you feel like they're, they're taking less risk and bringing it all in-house. They're reducing costs by saying, we're going to cut the inflated rates that we do when we outsource and try to control it in-house. So those, those economic shifts are creating this different behavior process um, all over the place. And I think the decision points, Lewis, as you said, like the decision points are changing as the clients give us that work. What, what about the technology? Let's get to the technology because that's what half the people here on this call for. Yeah, right. So there's an obvious thing that's happening, right? This is very efficient. Um, I, I, can't, I don't know if we started recording or not when we were talking about that. But the thought yep. process of like, instead of doing a stock footage search to do generative stock footage, you know, you can, you can ask the computer to do it, download it and be done in the time that you would usually do a stock footage search, search, download it, and then have to do clearance after the fact. So there's an efficiency in that one example. You might be finding efficiencies in your writing, in your production of keyframes, in your storyboarding, because you can get concepts out sooner, quicker, more quickly, maybe even more in the same, same amount of time. Um, and currently, because of it, the client isn't asking you. I mean, tell, tell me if anyone has a different um, story here, but it doesn't seem like clients are asking us to reduce that cost right now. So if you... If you're charging the client for a day or two days worth of work and you use AI and can get it done in four hours, the client currently is still accepting that two day paycheck or, 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 or invoice. And you can receive it and that's helping us supplement where the economy is bad. Hey, because the economy is bad, I have to find some efficiencies. It's driving me towards this technology so I can use it because it feels more efficient and it's driving us towards that as a solution where, and I can have a little bit of cushion now on my on my top line or my bottom line um, on my projects. Um, so to me, the technology shift is happening that way, not to mention it's new and it's different. It has a, has a more opportunity to visualize things. It's, it's interesting. I mean, it's not always great or it's pretty or it's working, but you know, sometimes I just go in the feed on Discord and watch other people's images to see what they're doing with it. And it's fascinating what's coming out um, through, mm. through some of these prompts. And I guess the third part of the trinity is the client behavior. Oh, wait, Lewis was going to ask a question. I think. Oh, Lewis, can you jump in? Sorry, Louis. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. I was just going to ask like about that. Do you think that that's like where it becomes critical to not be pricing per day, like, but be pricing more for, you know, pro like either project or value? Like, you know what I mean? Like when I say value, I mean more project, you yeah. know, rate so that you're not stuck in a, like the only thing that we put a, parameters on is like project with a date at the end of it, like rather than days, you know what I mean? So you can, yeah, you're not so if, stuck if in that were, sense of like reducing it to a day rate. So you're saying it, it, in case you were held accountable, in case the client said, well, how many days did it actually take you? And if you said right. it was going to no, be no, three we days. We have that conversation. Okay. Yeah. 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 We try not to have that conversation. Yeah. I, Avoiding the day rate conversation is great, but it is interesting that we we don't want to present our day rate when we talk to our clients, but it's the first thing we ask for from our freelancers, right? So no matter what, it's always part of an active conversation. There's a value-based proposition in someone's rate. Someone, somebody that does similar looking, similar activities, but one's making 450 and one's making 650, there's a value-based proposition just in the pricing of some of a rate. And I think that's one thing you have to recognize is that that pricing is you don't have an adjustment, not necessarily the amount of days. So a client might say, I still want you to work for three days because it's not due for two weeks, but I want you to do, do more within those three days. And because it's easier, I want you to reduce your price. Um, I could see that's the part. We're going to first feel it in the price crunch because we will adjust our prices to get that project. I really need that 10 grand in house. So I'm going to adjust it to take the 10 grand when I would usually charge 12, 14, 15. If I need the 10 grand, I'll take the, take the discount, right? Lewis, that's kind of what the, the client's asking you. Hey, if I give you this project, give you a discount. So the prices is what's being adjusted, not the amount of days. Yeah. yeah. It, um, Lewis and I are having a great conversation. Anybody else can chime in. I would just love to hear, uh, or, or has anyone had a price their AI output at this point? Has anyone tried to price it or um, even been held accountable of like, hey, that seemed like you did it with, with another tool. 
why am I paying for the full seven days? No, I mean, I've been seeing lots of, lots of clients doing style frames themselves and then bringing this reference in and then they realize this actually looks nothing like I want it to look. Can you help me make the good version of it? So in some ways I've seen people, it almost like opens them up to the creative process. It's like they've had a go and they realize that what they've made looks bad. And they're like, okay, yeah, I get why you're good at this stuff now because what I made looks crap. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that differentiator will be there. We'll find the differentiators as the time goes on. But um, the, the fact that nobody is raising their hand or saying they have to price AI goes to show you we're making more profit off of it because we're all using it one way or another. ChatGPT to make, to write an email or to you know, put, put information onto a board to help write a script or anything to give you a prompt, the image prompts that are happening or video prompts that are happening, it's helpful. It's helpful and it's and it's shortening the timeline that you're working on something to get that same output. So that will catch up to us. I'm just going to, there's, that's not a surprise. It's very obvious. It always does. But right now, while it's an anomaly and because we're looking for efficiencies, we're going to run to that a little bit more often. So we're really kind of burying ourselves. I don't know if bearings, right. We're really kind of trenching this because the economy is making us. And that's maybe the good news and the bad news about this thing is we're all like being leveled into technology and it, the opportunity is the same for all of us right now. Um, mm. I say that because you can imagine being the unfortunate nature of being really, really busy right now and half of you not being busy right now. So the half that aren't busy are learning this new technology and the half that are busy are too busy to learn it. Then there's an off balance and you don't get to catch up. Someone can be a year, six months, two years ahead of you and it's really difficult to catch up. Those technology evolutions happen all the time. Right now, there's something happening that the globally, there's a shrinkage and we're all learning at the same time. So the earth is very flat for this evolution. It's, it's pretty curious. Mm. You want to talk about clients now? Because because I'm going to, I want to, I almost want to throw a survey up here. Yeah. How fast well, can I, I make a survey? <laughs> I'll give you two. I'll give you two minutes. I mean, when we, yeah, when right. you had like cl the client part of the Holy Trinity, I was thinking, and like often clients are way younger than us. Like people in agencies are in their early thirties. You know, I'm personally not. I know there are some very handsome and beautiful young people on this call, <laughs> um, but um, they're young, and you know they. You know, some of I think in like when in that conversation about the AI photo studio, um, it was. Uh, they were talking about being through three technology revolutions. You know, maybe it's going from render farms, desktops to cloud computing. And a lot of people we're working with, they've been through one or they they were born into cloud computing. Like it's a, it's a given that, that it just exists. So I wonder like what is normal for them? It's just more pressure and having to do things faster. But a lot of them have probably been working under that pressure the whole time, their whole career so far. Gosh, that's, that's a really great point, Matt, because this thought process of, clients coming in younger and not knowing a differentiator is what will they buy? Like if they're used to getting a visual effect on Snapchat and then you're charging them for a visual effect, they're like, well, wait a second, my phone just does it. The, 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 rel the relevance to the effort or work it takes. <laughs> Jason's like, no, no, not going to happen. <laughs> you may mean that like it's the comprehensive of like, uh, of the the future buyer has been educated for differently than those who have been in the industry for 10, 12, 15, 30 years, whatever that is. There's a different reconciliation of what the technology would be for them and the client behavior will be different. Yeah. And yeah. some of it is the same shock that people get when they watch like a home renovation show where someone renovates the whole house in 48 hours and then they come to doing a renovation and they go, what? This took two years. Oh my God. Like, I think like there is a certain length of time that things take. And just because you've been brought up through home improvements or backyard blitz or whatever it is to think that you can do this stuff in 48 hours and then you get a, a short, sharp shock that you can't. I mean, there, there will be this for people when they go, but I could do this on my phone. Yeah. I could just add a, a face. Yeah, I want to keep seeing Jason shaking his head. R Riley just jumped on. I don't know if Riley... It was a victim to just being late to the game or if you did you want to say something riley or did you just uh turn on your camera by accident can you hear me all right yeah i i would i would say it's an interesting point is that because i'm coming from the design world 
and not production and all of that. But in the design world, in the last five years, you've seen this big trend of undesign, hence the awful fashion, the awful 90s influence over all of that that you see kids wearing right now. Thankfully, yeah. that's starting to take a turn. Uh, you know, I think I feel like we're on the last leg of really poofy pants for, for women and skinny jeans are going to come back in. You're going to have this, you know, great reawakening. But the undesigned trend has been god awful um, from new startups doing this very uh, disorganized, you know, packaging to their brand presentation. Everything about it has just been very messy and breaking a lot of design rules. With that said, I think to, to what you two were just talking about is that the uh the expectation on what these younger perhaps decision makers are looking at of they're coming from undesigned right so quality isn't isn't even a metric quality to them what to compare to what we grew up with of seeing holy smokes look what apple's doing right right that's like that's like fine swedish design like minimalism to its finest and yeah. uh and so we came from that so we're looking from that perspective they're coming from this undesigned very poor quality so i think you know, to that point, it's like, we can't, we, you can't sell a client based off quality because it's completely subjective. You can't be trying to sell on that. And that's, that's been true since, you know, day one. Right. And, and so I feel like as we're selling and pitching in this harder um, climate, it's like, you can't be having that conversation because that, that's just a dead end really. So you're saying so the, then the it's aesthetic like, okay. part of it, like the, the quality, meaning the aesthetic nature of it's just more beautiful. So I want to buy it. The, the people that grew up in a undesigned world, they don't know how to quantify the value of something like that. Andrew's making faces. He wants to say something. No. Is that what you're saying, Riley? Though? That's like it, right? It's like this undesigned. Uh, well, and I think the next order, of it. Yeah. The, and it goes beyond just like resolution. Cause like, I'd say like, you know, HDTV was supposed to be some major revolution that took place, but then YouTube came out around the same time and resolution didn't matter. Like, you know, there's like features that always felt like they're upgrades, but then quickly got, settled back what are you gonna see andrew yeah oh sorry i was gonna let riley finish. I, I, yeah i just want to <laughs> clarify is that it's it's the it's a generational kind of societal thing in the sense of you have it's just like we look at the young kids going, like, man what are they wearing right and then you it's all the stuff you hated from when you were younger and so even with ai right now we're going to have this huge wave where the quality just like just like we can nitpick and go oh the the you know balloon head thing it wasn't it didn't look like this or it didn't look like that and it's like okay that's coming from our you know very internal silo approach of being in design and production and actually noticing those things when the the general consumer they don't care about that they're, they're just looking at it as like oh my gosh right it's it, they're looking at it not from the quality standard but it's going to be a rude awakening because you're going to have this giant wave all of us are going to get screwed in it and then it's going to come back around to oh wow like there is craft there is craftsmanship yeah. to these things there is that quality and there's gonna be a desire for that and that's going to be you know, I don't, I don't know the timeline on that, but that's where I'm seeing this going. So it's like, A, you either close up shop, hold your breath or have a different conversation. And that's where I think, you know, but reflecting on Blair ends and all these other guys that are out there, it's like having that, that different conversation, it is key to it. It's key to all yeah. sales, right? And I think that's where, uh, unfortunately, production, all these things, it's like, that's all, that's all, you know, um, hands-on work. It's already, it's already pigeonholed the industry in an awful spot. Yeah. where these companies do take advantage of you. They put you on, you know, what, what was that term last year where it was like 365 day net or something for oh, yeah. the invoice? It was like, yeah. oh, what are you, like, it's, it is the- Sequential uh, liability, like when they pass on, yeah. No, I think yeah, they're, no, they're, like, they're making a great point because it is, is like, the, how do we understand the value of the future buyer if they've grown in this space? And, and I, I guess for some of us, we're saying we hope that AI is learning undesigned. So when the nature says we want something designed, the computer didn't learn it that way either and it won't be able to catch up to us so andrew you're going to say something i i'm just going to take what raleigh was saying a little bit further in that like it, it seems like what i've been seeing over the last 10 years and what was really kind of um uh it, it sped up by covid was the idea this this kind of old now old-fashioned idea that production value added to the trustworthiness of your product. That idea, I think, has... You used to be able to sell the production value based on like, oh, well, you know, you need this to be a trustworthy product, but, you know, a makeup brand, you know, you want to be the glitzy, the, the, the slick. Now it's it's UGC, um, you know, and us all like going to conferences on Zoom and, and you know, working on Zoom, 
just sped that process up. And I don't, even if things come back to, oh, wow, there's a craftsmanship to this, I don't know that you're ever going to be able to sell craftsmanship as trust anymore. I just don't see it happening. Or at least for a season, right? It's not going to be like we... What was, or tr craftsmanship yeah. as brand trust, I guess. Is, yeah, interesting. You know. it's, it's interesting to hear you guys talk because we throw these things out there and we put it on other objects. So we say like the economy is this problem. And then we say, you know, this technology is the problem. AI is going to do whatever. But you're what the conversation you're having right now is recognizing like, no, wait a second. There's a human process in this of how young you are, how soon you get in, what you're familiar with, and how that influences you. And that might be a bigger trend than the other elements. The economy ha is doing something to us. The technology is giving us the opportunity. But the buyers and the future buyers are what are, are, are more of the influence and not. Jason, did you want to say something? Oh, hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, in terms of what you're talking about uh, with, with youth, I think a couple of months ago, literally I had four different ad agencies ask me for the same thing. And it was a trend. And it's basically creative directors, art directors at ad agencies now. And it's a, it's a youth thing for sure. It's seeing things on TikTok and wanting to mimic it. And... I think that's a slippery slope. A, it's to be, it's just not that creative. I think it's embarrassing to be honest. And it's just, it was just fake out of home stuff. So they all wanted like 3D objects tracked in the real footage. So it looks like it was a done on like an AR app, not knowing that it's actually done, you know, properly. And so <laughs> it, but they literally, I'm not joking. It was like within like the, in a span of four weeks, four different art directors got a hold of me asking for the same stuff. And um, we can talk about AI all day, whatever, but it's literally getting their influences now are coming from quick social media grabs and, and trends. And, but then they also think that it's dead simple because they saw it on TikTok yeah. uh, or, yeah. or it's a, it's a filter or something. That's, that's my, that's my take on it. Sorry. It's yeah. loud here. I, I'll no, it's off. great. No, by the way, the background noise, we can't really hear it. So thanks for chiming in. No, it's it, that trend that's happening. This TikTok trend is something so different just the attention span necessary, the price per second goes up, increases by so much when the viewer is only willing to watch 10 seconds, you, your idea of pricing might be completely different because the consumer wants something. And it's interesting we say it's a slippery slope. I don't, I, I get where it is, but isn't, I don't, is it, or is it just the slope? <laughs> like it's, oh, we're always working against something. Jim, it's good to see your face. Did you want to jump in? Um, I mean, it's 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 good to join these, but I, I feel like this is, goes as far back as YouTube and anything else. I mean, terrible jump cuts in video, like became like a huge thing during that era, also, and it's just kind of part of the visual language at this point. Yeah. Uh, I mean, these are all these are all aesthetic decisions that kind of come and go, and video being shot with still cameras and everybody shooting these insanely shallow depths of field. It feels like there's every five, 10 years, there's another new visual language that everyone has to adapt to. But I agree about the expectation setting, which is that, and I blame Apple for this if we're going to blame people, but, you know, hey, anyone can do it on your phone. Anyone can do it with this. And, you know, TikTok does insane, you know, segmentation and 3D tracking and look at how easy it is. So how could it be so hard for you guys? Right, right. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure if it offers any answers, but I feel like I, I'm old enough to remember the 90s because that's when I came up. So I remember all the yeah. the not the undesigned that we're talking about. It's weird for, to see it come back, but there's a, I think every group will have a set of technological challenges with all this. There was, a, if you're a kid of the 90s, you know that there was a Michael Jackson video, black and white, where the faces morph from one to the other. And the technology necessary to get that morph to take place was like, you know, in the press for two years. But, you know, the group that did that just blew away anybody's technology. And the fact that my kids on Snapchat are doing that as fast as you can swipe your finger, those faces are changing and filters or whatever, and the morphing takes place is some of the, the evolution that takes place within technology and the consumption rate of something that took hours in a craft that now just happens through a, a filter. 
I think that's one thing that we're all recognizing that it's not not necessarily favorable for a craftsperson. The 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 Rev Thinking podcast that was that's being released this week. I don't know if it's been released yet. As it was Stephen Price. Stephen Price has been the editor of Stash Magazine or Stash, Stash Media for oh, over 20 years. And he started it because he was a fan of the industry. He used to go to Seagraph and no one was talking about this worldwide content and worldwide artists that were doing things. Um, so he wanted to cover it than just the local or US-based trades that were doing it. I asked him about the technology shift and what he thought just in the span that which he's doing it. And he compared or took the um, the analysis of the people that when early '90s again, if you wanted a if you wanted a font, somebody had a paintbrush and they painted it onto something. That's how we that's how it was made. So when when the Max came out and you could you know type it and set it, and actually Photographer was a software that can do something. There was a disruption and those artists disappeared with almost the same language of saying, hey, but the, you know, that craft is gone and these new artists are not going to be real at all. Instead, what happened was motion design popped in and now you can animate font across pages because of the computerization, the, dig digital, the digitizing of those fonts. So there's the evolution I think that some of us know that's happening is a question of, you know, maybe some lamenting that something's going away. But is anybody excited about the the evolution becoming something that they're going to have their hands on? And there might be something different that we will enjoy and will have value, different value, but we'll have value. We're going to find out the young people from the old people really quick who answers this question, right? <laughs> Riley's smiling. <laughs> I know. I, I think it's funny. It's a desperate, a desperate uh, calling for the silver, silver lining. I, wait, I want, I want to say first, you know, with, with AI, to me, it's interesting because it is the aggregate of the average and which the internet is almost that in and of itself, right? And so just like we talk about these things, these trends and these demands based off TikTok, and it's all what people are seeing. So it's, it's already the novelty, if any, is already, is already zapped out of it. Whoever thought of that thing and ran with it, some nice marketing firm, whatever, it's gone, right? Now everyone else is following suit. And so that's averaging, right? That, that's the bell curve. And I think in our world, the, the client will see that and they're, they're already steps behind, right? And they see that and they go, oh, I want that. And that's that's ordinary, right? And like, I don't want to be paid to come up with ordinary. Like what, what I want to be paid for or what I want to be known for is extraordinary. And so for me to come up with extraordinary, I can't be ordinary and I can't have ordinary things. And that's where the the, the average is ordinary. And, and I think when we look at AI, when we look at the internet, when we look at trends and all that junk that's out there, it's like, that's all average and it's it's not extraordinary. And we can use these things to help build it. Like AI is a powerful tool. I, I think it's extremely powerful. And I, I do believe that there will be great ways to um, use it. Like I, I have conversations with it, just the talking, right? And it's, and it's cool just to exercise and, and, and kind of work out doing that. But I, I think from our creative world, it's like, I always feel like like our, our people just get so like down in the dumps about it. <laughs> and I'm like, no, it's we, we need to be, we are creatives and we're paid to be creative. Like that's that's the point. We're not we're not we're not paid to just you. you know create, but but we're paid to be creative. And to creative. me it's like that's what you're that's your magic, you know. And and I just don't want us to lose that hope because I feel like that's gonna be, you know, everyone from freaking Brian Collins, who's killing it out there with massive brands to the small freelancer. I'm like the the, the creative power. That's what's that's what's powerful. That's the brain, not not to create. It, it's great to create. But that's I the love hands. it. Yeah, Lewis, what do you got? I just think what Riley just said is dead on. That that the the I feel like what AI what the people are doing are racing to a norm because the bean counters are the most people the most excited about it. They're racing to a, a, an average. You know what I mean? Like they just want to, to end some of the pain, the, the 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 things they're paying for, and I think what Riley said is just dead on. Um, I I think that th there's a way to slow down the conversation and be kind of the expert and the and the like you said, like Riley about being paid to be creative and extraordinary. You know, go beyond the norm. You know, in the conversation and and make the point that you're you know, an agency, make the point that you're, you know, you, you're a business and, you know, make that point that I think it's really important always to stand out from like the, 
low sort of bar to entry folks who just are like a person with a computer. I think it's important to do that, you know, but I think Riley's dead on. I want to hear someone say the words. I want someone to practice or put, put me to practice. I don't care, but I think we have to have somebody here say the words where they have to defend themselves. I'm going to use the wrong word. I don't mean defend, but you know what I mean by that, but like defend the idea that the value you present is greater than a technological evolution. Who, who, who already has had to say that to a client or would step up today in front of this large audience and be able to be so bold? Anybody? Because it's right that we we are all thinking it, but I, I almost wonder, like, do we have the words yet to express it? It's somewhere in our heart, but is it coming out yet? Well, don't you think, don't you think, I mean, I I think it's, I think it's for some clients, it's clear that they need a brain behind any of the technology. I think the ones who are, as Riley was saying, racing to that norm, you know, racing to that that average to be ordinary, like the the incredible alacrity that they're like get to, to be normal, they're not the kind of clients who are gonna listen. They're the ones who are afraid for their jobs. And I think just trying to create what's already been created. They're not the ones who acknowledge that creativity. Yeah, okay. So I I so I again like I feel like we have to be able to speak this into the marketplace because we're, aren't we going to be questioned someday and maybe sooner than later to have to to say no 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 we don't the technology doesn't matter it's the creative mind the value is in the in the the execution or the is this a hard one to defend or is this easy to defend i'll, I'll do it well, i think somebody wants to be the client I, i'll, I'll, I'll roll i think there's a thing. There's there's an aspect to this that I think um, we miss sometimes, and that's the fact that uh, most of our clients in some level want to be creatives. They love the idea that the barrier to entry is easier because you, some of them we've even had say to us, uh, I like the idea that I get to, instead of spending my day to day going after financing to get the ideas out of my head, that I could actually just use a tool and get the ideas out of my head. I think... Yeah. Where our value proposition is um, is not going to be threatened is the fact that when everybody can create stuff with AI, the uh, the haystack gets bigger. And so the effectiveness of that content goes away because you're going to have seven Star Wars movies made by fans every week. At what point do you start to devalue the medium? At what point does it stop doing what the client needs it to do, which is get butts in seats? So I think it's going to come full circle again, just like the internet, you know, it used to be relationship and then it became bullhorning and followings. And now it's coming back to relationship again. That's where our value as artists stands out nice. is in the way that we empathize, the way we build relationship. And that's going to be more needed than ever as that haystack gets bigger. Yeah. I mean, consumption worked that way too, right? I can go get cheap private movies as much as I want. And then now it's coming back to like, now it's coming back to advertisement because eventually the economy has to correct itself and people have to get paid for the content they're making. They can't just throw cash at something. Um, so the, right, our, our clients the, that are speaking to their consumers or their followers, they're going to need some recognition of connectivity, uh, a brand identity, um, I don't know, follower following um, trends tribalism whatever they're going to want from from the work that you're doing oh there's examples of it right now i mean that we see every day look at uh apple's app store i mean i come from a video game background i used to do development stuff like that it used to be a million dollars just to have access to a game engine to make a game if you wanted to do it now anybody can download unity or unreal and you know the apple store is the race to the bottom right? Like there's a million garbage apps on the app store and it's really hard for people to make quality apps and stand on the app store for that reason. Yeah. I think we're running into just our own version of that, but more with visual mediums. Yeah. Interesting. I'm going to pivot here just for a second. Has anybody recognized this, this trend of clients ghosting them? When I, when I've been asking around, people are like, oh yeah, that's kind of happening where the ask is there, um, but there's a different behavior cycle happening where usually you would do a pitch or be asked for something or follow up on something, and the usual follow-up isn't there. And even if you lean into it, 
you get ghosted. Um, I, I'm wondering if there is like a something else happening in the, in the demand of what is what happening with with our clients that is causing like like the ghosting is a feedback loop or some kind of residual pressure point that is um, accepted somewhere else and they just don't have time to respond or they don't realize they're doing it or. We just need some more old school heads of production who teach people what good manners mean. Yeah. Well, because I, I asked that question because I think there's a value-based respect that is out there, right? And the idea that not just the, the you know, give me what I need or the value that you present doesn't seem that difficult because I have it on TikTok a, approach is almost like, well, do are you also not being respected um, in the marketplace? Is the, the value provide not only devalued, but you as the relationship kind of being skipped. Anyone else feeling that trend? I, I think that's happening like crazy, but I, I I try to have a thick skin about, I mean, I feel like I feel like half of my workout is devoted to thickening my skin to just <laughs> take the, um, you know, the, the barbs of that. Uh, I mean, it, it's just, it's as a people person, it's a really horrible part of it, you know? Um, but I haven't had it in the midst of a project, you know, happening like during a pitch process. I've had it more, you know, between engagements. Yeah. So, it, yeah, go ahead. I was going to, hey, 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 Tim. Hey, Jerry. Um, yeah, I've noticed that with a few clients. And so what, what, we've done is go through we got quite a long list of clients and we're now questioning how strong are those relationships what is the value that we bring to that client are we just another one of 20 vendors with that client and were we just the the, the vendor they could count on when they're really busy and now they don't have a lot of work or they just have one thing to do and they and they and, and they have a stronger relationship so we're we're looking at ourselves and 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 all our clients. Uh, who do we have the best relationships with? What are the values? Why why is that a good relationship? What value do we bring to them? What is it that is so unique about Deep Sky compared to other studios? Because there's a lot of studios like us too. Yeah. And 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 that's what we're finding is the clients that are more responsive is because we have a stronger relationship with them we have brought them more value not just a great video um we maybe we worked with them for years and they just there's somebody that we worked with a year and a half ago and i reached out said hello but a little bit more to it and and, and now they just reached out to us today out of the blue it never responded probably the last two ones and now they have a project it's just one of those things like um yeah uh, the, the relationship and value and if, if you're getting ghosted it's either something's going on with them or you never really had a strong relationship to, to begin with. Well, that, that, that's almost my question is, is like, yeah. are we recognizing- A commodity, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, commodity, yeah. That's almost what my question is, is that are we are we saying value, but sometimes we mean respect too. I'm just wondering if, do people respect the work you're doing? Do they respect the output? Do they respect the hours you've put into something and respect the years you've had in the industry? And we're trying to find a value proposition like, no, you owe it to me because I have experience instead of trying to learn how to be respected and, and honored. And I think Riley, some of the conversation you were saying was something along the lines of like being accepted for the expert that you are is a sign of respect and, and to live out, um, you know, be part of this industry and try to live out and be respected in that way. I'm just wondering if our words would change if that's a bigger need than just the economic exchange of the price per element I'm giving you. Um, and your positioning might be different and your qualifications of client might be different if that was the problem too. Uh, I just want- I think a lot of them are transactional about the relationship until they lose their job and write you after. I mean, that has <laughs> yeah. happened to me so many times in the last two years. You know, like where I get the, can I pick your brain email? And I'm like, do you want to look at the last 14 emails you didn't respond to before you pick my brain? And I mean, like, it's stunning. I mean, and I think what Matt said before is just dead on about having an old school producer to sort of 
show res how respect works. But I mean, that's just so common right now. I mean, people are losing their jobs like crazy and I have people coming out of the woodwork wanting to talk. Yeah. Yeah, I think there is I mean, like an element there. Go ahead, Andrew. Andrew. I was just going to say my experience with ghosting during the pitching process, like, you know, we've, we've had it both ways, you know, two clients, two very big clients, uh, project in the middle of the pitch process, one ghosted. And we finally, like when we finally pinned them down, like, and we're able to get a response. Cause like they bumped into us at a like public event. Um, it turned out the money had been swallowed by another department and they just didn't know how to talk to us. Yeah. You know, it was simple. Whereas, the other side, another company, like we had total communication and it ended up in, it ended up in that person losing their job, but then hiring us to do almost the same work at the new place they got hired. Cause they were, you know, had been through the, all the creative conversations of the pitch. So it, I, it can go either way. And I think it sometimes it, it's not, it's not always you. Sometimes it is them, but sometimes it is how they, you know, interrelate with people. And maybe they just don't know how, you know, it's hard for some people to say, hey, I've been talking to you for three weeks about, you know, a half million dollar project. And by the way, this guy just took my money. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I <laughs> I think there's a youth quality or a, like a maturity quality that that or just timing generational quality of, of those conversations that ghosting is more familiar. It's more understood and OK. Um, I think chat room behavior has some of it too. Like in chat, you can just walk away. You don't have to say goodbye and hello or whatever. In email culture, we were like all these headers and dear so-and-sos and thank you and bests or whatever. Just um, there's trends that are kind of being played out here and we don't want to misread um, the signs, I guess, is the big picture there. Hey, we're going to lose, start losing people because it's getting to the top of the hour. Um, if you like this conversation, I want to invite you into these uh, confab groups that we have. I'm going to start a new series called Life Changing Money. Um, I, I, someone asked me recently or said to me recently, I made a lot of money, but it wasn't life changing money. And I thought like, well, no, these words are really great together, but also separate. And I, the, the idea is like, just like, can we grab a hold of what the issues are for real? And are they life issues? Are they trans, transitional issues? Or is it just something simple like we just need the money? and be able to separate those and grow within our business so that we're, we're asking for the right proposition from our clients or understanding the right value that we're giving our, our, our studio, our employees in our studio, um, or the work that we're doing. I think there's a lot happening in the world that we have to ask those questions separately instead of trying to get one big goal. I think the one big goal of life-changing money is not going to get us to the next threshold that we need to get to professionally in this industry. Um, so if you love this conversation, you want to do this stuff, this is how it works. We just do round tables like this. Um, we'd have three of them now. We'll probably start two more, and especially if you're a new company and you want to know some of the foundational elements of it, Matt's going to start a group um, with some other leaders to do that. So I love this, by the way, this is my, like, if you want to know Tim at his best, you know, give me the, ask me anything, throw anything at me model. And I, I, I can, I can do this all day. Um, which is why I go 15, 20 minutes over <laughs> my my promise dead end. But if you if you want to keep talking, I'll keep talking. Um, but I also want to respect your time. Um, uh, is there anything I could do for you? Just reach out and ask questions. I think some of you, um, hopefully I haven't ghosted any of you. Many of you have asked me for those spreadsheets I had over the last couple of weeks. And if you haven't asked me for those spreadsheets, if you're in a cash flow crisis, you need some media tool you please just ask me. I have them. I just send you a link and I send you a video and you can start filling it in. But I'd rather have you ask questions than, than suffer the fate that some, some agencies are dealing with right now. So um, I want to be stronger together so we can do that. I appreciate you. I like to sign off this way that I exist so that you can thrive in business, life, and career. But I, uh, but I really mean it because uh, there's so many things I think about on your behalf. If you're going to off, I want to see you there live next week. And we will still be meeting here on this Zoom call, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. I'll just be in Barcelona. Um, all right, so great to see you all. We'll see you next week.